So good to see each and every one of you here this afternoon. And uh, this is uh, a very interesting chapter in front of us. We only read nine verses together. Hopefully we'll be kind of touching on the remaining portion of the chapter. It must be reminded that this chapter has Daniel as he's positioned his book as a symmetrical. He loves to balance his story. So the first six chapters gives you the historical narrative of his experiences as a king's helper, a king's wise man. He was working for the government. So any of you that have ever worked for the government know that there's always somebody there to stab you in the back. And Daniel experienced that. Daniel experienced that many times. But he also knew who had his back. And it was none other than the Lord God, his Savior, Jehovah. And so this particular occasion is the symmetrical opposite of Daniel chapter 4. And in Daniel chapter 4, we have a great king considering his city, Babylon. And in Daniel chapter 9, we have a great prophet considering his city, Jerusalem. One city is high and lifted up with its hanging gardens. Another city is in complete ruins. Just a desperate opposite, if you ever could imagine. In Nebuchadnezzar's chapter 4, his consideration gives room to pride, to elevated, ah, this is Moa, this is me that did this. And, of course, he's brought low because God is opposed to the proud, but he will give grace to the humble. Those of us who serve him, those of us who willingly seek to be his servants, we have to advance on our knees. There is no service they can't, and there's no place for the servant of God to be exalting self. In Nebuchadnezzar chapter 4, his consideration gives room to pride, but Daniel, as a humble servant, his consideration causes him to go to prayer, to confession, to ashes and sackcloth, even to fasting. How many of you have ever fasted? Not asking for a show of hands, just you can answer that emotionally, mentally, or otherwise. Fasting is really taught in Scripture. But it's taught not as a health practice. It's not like the alternate to the Kudo diet or the Aikens diet. You know, go on a fast and you, well, you will learn, lose weight. There's no question about it because you've stopped eating. But that's not the point of a fast. The point of a fast is to tune our hearts and our minds and our spirits towards God. Not to manipulate God. Some people think, oh, I fast three or four times every month, and I really get answers to prayer. Well, actually, you do. But the fasting tunes you into God's heart that you might then be asking the right thing from the Lord in your prayers. There's quite a difference. We are not talking about Christian magicians we are talking about disciples of Jesus who are called humbly to be his servants. And so Daniel fasts, prays, and confesses. Sir Edward Denny, a noted prophetic student of the last century, called this chapter, chapter 9, the backbone of all prophetic understanding. It's really interesting that I was reading Harry Ironside, H.I. Ironside, and um, Harry was a great student. Did you know he was a Canadian? I didn't realize that until I read his biography. He was born in Toronto, spent most of his time in the United States as an evangelistic preacher, ended up at Moody Church as the uh, back main, main lead teacher at Moody Church and wrote fabulous commentaries. He's got an excellent commentary on the book of Daniel. And I love the way one chapter ended. He said this way, and I'll just briefly summarize. He said, in the time that we are now in, it would be uh, understandably so to realize that there is an impending doom around the corner. There is great and awesome events about to happen. 
And these events are going to usher in the need for people to get right with God. You see, prophecy is not like a, a photographic calendar that's meant to say, here's how you church away. I love, I love um, our, our little uh, uh, maps that come on the screens. I love, uh, no, I don't like the, the voices though, so we tuned them out. But I like the fact that you can get helps as to where to go to avoid the pitfalls, the, uh, the accidents, the high, high traffic areas. Prophecy is none of that. Prophecy is designed to bring us into a right relationship with God in our prayer life, but more importantly, so that we might be able to evangelize and reach the lost with the message of the gospel. Daniel, his immediate response, as he's looking in verse 1, he understands something that's really cool. It says in verse 2, in the first of the reign of Daniel, Darius, I, Daniel, understood by the books. Hey, this wasn't a vision at this point. He understood by reading God's word. And what word did Daniel have to read? The prophet Jeremiah. But more than that, because it's a plural, it says books. And so Daniel, at this point in time, is, is, is recognizing what Paul recognized as he spoke to Timothy when we said all scripture is given by inspiration of God. God breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Did you know prophecy is part of that all scripture? If we read prophecy and all we're getting out of it is a calendar of prophetic events for the future and it doesn't impact our hearts and correct our spirits and make us more godly and holy, we have missed. It says in Revelation, the spirit of prophecy is Jesus. And we need to read, read prophecy differently than what is so often being promoted today. And it comes back, as we said earlier, to the great errors of the 18th and the 19th centuries when they looked at the current events and they said, ah, we've got it. Get ready to go. Sell all you have because he's coming. And they started planning dates. And I always say, what part of no one knows the day or the hour, what part of that statement did they not understand? Because they had it booked right and solid. And if you think that that was just in the past centuries, the 1800s, and well, it happened again in the 19th, early 1900s, and it had happened again a couple of times, even in our own days, 20, 2013, 2014, we were hearing again, he's coming back, and the dates were there. And in fact, even as a couple of years ago, during the time of the blood moons, we were hearing, he's coming back. It's got to be at the feast of, uh, of uh, in September, at, at the feast of, of uh, which, which feast is it? Does anyone remember? There's one feast in particular they were talking about. I think it was the feast that uh, deals with uh, of atonement, perhaps. I think it was the feast of atonement. And, um, and he's coming then. He has to come then because that's the blood moon feast. And I think I've even gotten a little bit into that at times. And so if I have, I'm sorry if I've caused you to err on that point. But we have a prophetic word Confirm that you do well to heed as a light which shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Do you get it? The morning star. What is that morning star? Well, it is the Lord Jesus, but the, the person that he was writing to would think of that morning star and he would realize that's the star that heralds the start of a new day. That gives us hope. Any one of you who've ever worked a night shift and you're getting about three o'clock in the morning or about four o'clock in the morning and it is hard and you're getting to the point where your eyelids are getting heavy and you're saying, I don't have enough strength. And then you go out and you look and there's the morning star. You say, oh, we're almost finished the shift. Daybreak is coming soon. I've got hope I can make it through another shift. That is the message for you and for me today. 
because he doesn't say you have to make it till next week. He says you have to make it each day. That's all he needs to give you grace for. Grace for today. Hopefully, something of what is said today will encourage you to have that grace and receive it from the Lord. So what did he do? He looked at Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 11. If you turn to that, you can make a note to that. Jeremiah 25, verse 11 says, And the whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and those nations shall serve the king of Babylon seventy years. And it will come to pass, when seventy years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, says the Lord, and I will make it a perpetual desolation. And then Jeremiah 29, verse 10, For thus says the Lord, After seventy years are completed in Daniel, in, in Babylon, sorry, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and cause you to return to this place. Daniel was studying the books. Are you and I studying the books? Or are we just listening to sermons, watching videos, and letting somebody else tell us what the books say? Because Daniel would study the books. Now, key to this is something that is very important. Daniel was a prophet, and a prophet it takes to understand prophecy. If you don't have that spiritual gift, please don't come up with a calendar of the Lord's return for me because you really need to have that prophetic gift to understand prophecy. And there are varying gifts, varying ministries, but prophet understands the timetable. He was able to say, I could read this, and this is now. And guess what? It's almost coming. The 70 years have always come, almost come to pass. It says so as well in 2 Chronicles 36, 20 and 21. By the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbath, as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. And again, Ezra 1, verses 1 and 2. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, the word of the Lord spoke by Jeremiah, the mouth of Jeremiah, that it might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up by the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation and said, I have been commanded to build a, him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. That's how specific the prophecies of the Lord are. You know, there's never been a prophecy yet that has not come to pass. Some are still waiting. We are still waiting for some, but they have all come to pass. And so, Zechariah 7, verse 5 says it this way, Say to all the people of the land, when you fasted and mourned the fifth and the seventh months during those 70 years, did you really fast for me? And he looks back on the 70 years. And so four separate sections of the Bible Describe the 70 years that was going to take place. And Daniel was saying, this 70 years is just about up. And as he set his face toward the Lord, look at what happens. Well, first of all, what does it mean to set your face towards the Lord? What does that mean? Well, first of all, it means where you're looking. Where you're looking. John Lennox, who was a, a, a wonderful Christian, stated that he was called to speak at a lifelong friend's funeral. This man was younger than John, and John had not expected him to die. Just some weeks beforehand, Lennox was able to visit his friend and asked him what he would say at his funeral. And without hesitation, his friend said, tell them to do what we did when we were students. Tell them to read the Word of God together, discuss it, think about it, pray about it, wait on God until His face appears. You need to set your face towards the Lord. And Daniel would seek God and set his face and seek by prayer. Multitudes are seeking God, but they do not set their faces to seek. How do we know that? Because there's no desire for holiness. How can a man be a Christian without a changed heart? How can he be granted the gift of a new heart without truly seeking and asking with honesty? So many seek the face of God and peace without truly seeking for mercy, compassion, and the life of Jesus. If you will seek the Lord your God, you will find him when you seek for him with all your heart and with all your soul. 
So there's what, one way to approach God, only one, and that is to seek the one name and plead that name, Jesus Christ. Daniel 4, 29. So there must be, in the beginning, our seeking and our looking for and our reliance upon God. But the, it wasn't just a seeking. There was also a position, a direction. He said he set his face towards the Lord, verse 3, and make requests by prayer and supplications. In other words, this was the direction that he was setting his face towards. You see, righteousness is not a position, it's a direction. Let me explain. There's a common idea that separates wrong from right like two countries, like the frontier, like the border. Here's right and here's wrong. And if you go into this area, you're going into right. If you go over here, you're going into wrong. Well, if what about that? So long as you've not actually crossed the line into wrong, you're okay. You're all right. Well, how do you draw the line between selfishness, which is sin, and the care for your own body, which we are called to do? Because our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And over and over again, Paul, as he reminded the Corinthians and the Galatians and the Ephesians, he said, you've got to walk differently. You've got to be a changed person. You have to live a godly life. But you can't be self-preoccupied either. How do we do that? And I like what the author to Hebrews said, looking to Jesus. Keep your focus on the Lord Jesus. Not on me. Not on your spouse if you have one. Not on the government if you are prone to do those things. Not on the media. But keep looking to Jesus. A simple illustration maybe helps helpful here. What is the difference between East and West? Is there any dividing line between East and West? Where does East stop and West begin? Well, there is no dividing line. You can't put a dividing line, but you can tell in a moment which way you're heading. Which way are you facing? So no one who is facing the Lord with sinfulness in their heart can find him. And what we mean by that is if you were going into that meeting with God and you are going in with predetermined sinful actions, you will never find the Lord in those situations. But there is never a line drawn which can divide evenly from right, or exactly from right and wrong. But you can tell in a moment whether you're living in the direction of right or the direction of wrong. A child goes to the door, looks out, and you've told them, don't go outside. And they, as they look out the door, they say, well, I haven't gone out. My feet are still inside the house. And then they put one foot just on the threshold, and they're still looking at you, and, they, and you look at them, and they say, I haven't gone outside, I've just got my foot on the threshold, on the step. And then you shake your head a little bit to that child, and it says, but I haven't yet gone out. But you can say you've already gone out in your heart. A little boy was, was told, you need to be quiet in the meeting because you're distracting the service. And he said, okay. And he was kind of angry about it. And his mother looked at him and his father looked at him and he said, well, the little guy seems to be obeying us. He hasn't said a word, but he looks awful sour. And you could see he was, mm, it wasn't really making any sounds, but his face showed a lot of anger. And they finally said to him after the service was over, well, you really were quiet. He says, I was, but I was shouting a lot in my mind. <laughs> you see, it's in the heart where we really come face to face with the Lord. Daniel calls upon the Lord in his heart. He calls, and did you notice how he speaks so much of God? He calls God awesome, the awesome God, who keeps covenant. This is in verses 4. And with those who love him and with those who keep his command, and then goes on to say in verses uh, 6 and 7, he says, O oh Lord, righteousness belongs to you. And then he goes on to say in verses 9, to the Lord belongs mercy and forgiveness. He's got his eyes on the qualities and the character of God. When Moses was asking the Lord to show him his glory, 
the Lord comes to him and says, I will show you my glory, but I'll put you in the cleft of the rock. And I'll cover you with my hand, the backside of my hand, so you will not see my face, but you will see my glory. And as the voice goes by him, he sees, here's the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and merciful full of compassion and grace. He, this is the first quality that he hears. He doesn't hear the wrath of God. He doesn't hear the anger of God. He doesn't hear of the holiness of God, although these are all part and parcel of who God is. But he hears of his compassion, his mercy. Christian brother and sister, when people talk about you, is the first thing they think of is mercy and compassion and the love of Jesus. And I'm speaking to myself when I say that, because it's so very easy to be caught up passionately with the righteousness of God and forget his compassion and his mercy, his tender heartness and love. Like a father, he's compassionate and mercy. He forgives us our sins. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. He talks about God. When you go to prayer, who do you talk about? We need to learn how to speak to God. But we also need to learn that God answers when we speak with him. If you haven't been getting answers to prayer, it may be that you haven't been speaking with the Lord. I say that seriously to Christians as well as to non-Christians. It says of the man who went in to uh, the temple and there was a Pharisee standing up in front but the publican, the sinner, the tax collector was at the far back and it says that the, the, the tax collector, the publican, the sinner said, God be merciful to me, the sinner. And the other gentleman turns around and sees this wretched sinner in his eyes and he says, I'm so thankful, Lord, Oh, Lord, you've made me. I'm going to give praise to you because I'm not like that guy. And Jesus says, this wretched sinner, the one who called for mercy, was heard. The one who vindicated themselves was never heard. They prayed thus to themselves. That's all that heard them, their own mind and their own ears. And so his prayer got results. Six times he confesses, we have sinned, we have missed the mark, we have disobeyed, we have ungodliness, we have done wrong, we have rebelled, we have departed from your precepts, we have not heeded your servants, the prophets. Did you notice it's we? Now Daniel, in all of the scriptures, there's never once any specific sinful action that is listed for him. Now, he's not any more perfect than any other person. All have sinned and fallen short, including Daniel. He was a sinful man. He identifies with the sinners. We have sinned, but he never once has any reports of wrongdoing in his life. And that's pretty amazing for somebody that works for the governor, you know, because when you work for the government, the first thing that happens is somebody wants to see if they can get something from you that they wouldn't normally get from the government. Kickbacks are common. I hate to say that. I'm not speaking of any personal knowledge of kickbacks when I say that. I'm speaking of the heart of man and the heart of women. And so this man identifies with the sinners. Six consequences of sin. Verse 8, shame. Verse 9, uh, and eight, driven out as this day, the men of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, all Israel, uh, the need for mercy, verse nine, the need for obedience, verse 14. And so we have the various acts of, of uh, the people listed. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord. But the good news is this. When you read verse 20, and I would encourage you to read the whole chapter because uh, it's just impossible in this short a time to, to uh, detail it all. But when you read verse 20, it says, While I was speaking, praying, and confessing my sin, and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplications uh, before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I'd seen in the vision at the beginning, 
was caused to fly swiftly and reach me about the time of the evening offering. He got results. Well, he got amazing results. He got an angel to visit with him. And uh, we have to be, uh, uh, I don't know that we expect to see angels, but I do know this, that God will visit us when we pray. He will give answers. And it says, at the beginning of your supplication, as the command went out, I have come to tell you that you are, what do you suppose this angel had as his primary message to Daniel? You're going to see the answer to your, to your prayer. You're going to know the future. Oh, isn't that going to be exciting, Daniel? No. He says, you are greatly beloved. You are loved of God. You know, that's what we really need today, to be told that God loves us. One time a man was walking off the, off the uh, plane. He was a noted Bible scholar, very, very high in intellect. And they said, what is the, what is the greatest thing you have ever learned in all your days as a scholar? He said, that's simple. Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. We need to know the love of God. You know, it's the love of God that's going to be there with you when you're standing beside a graveside and you can't understand why. It's the love of God that will be with you when you are looking at an accident scene and you say, I never imagined that. It's the love of God that will be with you when you're comforting family and relatives and you're trying to know what to say and you have no words to say and you suddenly start to cry and you don't usually cry but that's the love of God you're expressing God's love for that person God will give you all you need when the time you need it and not a minute before and so he gets the first message you were greatly beloved. And then he goes on and describes the 70 weeks. Now, 70 weeks, very briefly, because I only have one minute left <laughs> to talk about the 70th week, are divided up into three periods of time. The first period of time, by the way, the word weeks is heptad, which means a period of seven. So normally they take them as 70 weeks, but also it's applied for seven weeks of years. It, it, it could equally be applied that way. And so he says, going from the know and understand from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks, 62 weeks, and then after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off after the 69th week. So Robert Anderson did a very interesting study. You can look it up online. And as you look it up, you will discover that, and there is a book written, The Coming Prince, I think is what it was called, or something similar to that. Um, as he studied it out, he discovered that from the time that Cyrus issued the proclamation to the time that Jesus came in on the donkey's um, back into Jerusalem was exactly 489 years. To the day. Now, again, we have uh, many people that will dispute that. They would say, uh, actually, it doesn't quite work. Well, you, you can do the you can do the studies. I'll simply say this much. I, I, I'm, I'm of the view that the, the, the time works for me. But there's one week left. And where is that one week? Well, that one week says after the 62 weeks, that's the 69th week, the Messiah is cut off. The coming prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. It happened in AD 70. General Titus destroyed the city and the sanctuary. And most people who study prophecy say when the sanctuary, that is the temple, was destroyed, the prophetic clock stopped. Now you say, well, where do you get that? Did you know that at the most recent... Um, Meaning a meeting, the COP meeting that they were discussing climate change. One of the statements that was said by the uh, 
by the gentleman from Britain, the Prime Minister of Britain. He said, the clock is now at two minutes to midnight. Now, despite the fact that we may not necessarily agree with that analysis of climate change, it's a common analogy to say that we are in the last days or times of this world. When you look at the last week, it says that in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. Well, how can he bring an end to sacrifice and offering if there is no temple? Because the temple is destroyed at the 69th week. Well, it's pretty apparent that there will be a temple because even Paul speaks about the Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 coming and announcing in the temple of God that he is God. So if that is the case, there's a great number of Bible scholars believe that there will be a rebuilt temple. I tend to lean in that direction as well. However, I want to make sure that you are aware there's an alternate view that says the Bible declares that you and I are the temple of the Holy Spirit. There is a rebuilt temple going on. So the Antichrist may declare himself within the context of the Christian church as well. And that's an alternate perspective that makes a lot of sense as well. and doesn't require a physical building to be erected. However, you don't have a stop of sacrifice with that version. So it, it doesn't quite hold the same water as, as, the, as the first particular position. When it's saying all that, it says, he will bring an end to the sacrifice and on the wing of abominations, that's the what uh, Jesus refers to in Matthew 24 when the abomination of desolation takes place. And the wing of abomination shall the one who makes desolate even until the consummate which is determined is poured out upon the desolate. It ends on a rather uh, notable, notable ending. So I think what we should do is remind each one of us that the ending doesn't stop there. All the other visions describe uh, that fifth kingdom, that fifth kingdom, which is the kingdom of God, which shall never be destroyed. And that's found in, um, well, for example, Daniel 7, that uh, I was watching in the night visions, and one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven, and came and they brought him near before him and he was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all nations and peoples and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom is one which shall not be destroyed. And so I don't want to end on Daniel chapter 9 but rather on the other chapters which speak of the fifth kingdom because I think it's important for us to realize that there is a second, another kingdom coming. And if you read Revelation 13 and Revelation 18, you find there's a lot of parallels to the very passages that we've been looking at. I realize that it's hard to take a passage like this and say, well, now we've studied Daniel 9, but we officially have, but we really haven't. There's a lot here that you could look into, and I suggest that you do so. And uh, while you're doing it, remember the method that Daniel implied to do it. He fasted and he prayed. He came in humility. He came recognizing that he was not a perfect person. We have sin. And he came seeking God's face. And as he does so, God hears and answers. By the way, prophecy is the last topic for every Christian to get a hang handle on. Whatever position you finally hang your hat on, it's always the last because it's always the most difficult to understand. But it's the most delightful because it causes us to change into his image. As we behold him, we have that image of him coming, our faces glow, and we are changed into his likeness. May that be the response of our hearts, even as we study prophecy. May God bless you.